I, I, I hope I'm not that renowned. I think notorious <laughs> might be a better word. I'll get to know. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Hornsby, and thank you to all of you for coming. And thanks for, to the Bed Interest Trust and the, the other partners who are here, the Ultra and the Oratory. It's a real pleasure to speak here on the theology of the Mass. But I must start, really, by saying it's an unwarranted honour for me. Firstly, because I'm not really an academic, per se. And I'm only a student of theology, in a sense, not a master of it. And add to that the fact that I'm still young, and I don't really have even the wisdom and experience of years, there are far greater people that could talk. However, I'm recently ordained, and I'm a priest, so I can bring that perspective as well. And I think also, since this is um, partly a series for young people, there are lots of young people here connected with the Order of Malta, volunteers, etc., it's good that, um, while I'm still young for a little while, we can talk and have a voice in the big world as well. And scary though that is, it must happen. And uh, I suppose, if I had to talk on the mass, I would say that I'm something of an amateur liturgist. Um, you know, rather like young Catholics who appear in novels, and they say, well, I am a Catholic, but I don't like other Catholics very much. Um, I might say that I am a sort of amateur liturgist, but People that call themselves liturgists, I often find very tiresome, so I'm not sure that I embrace that metier as much as I should. Um, there are many notable exceptions. But um, I think it was Father Robbie who um, mentioned in his talk about the jokes about liturgists, and they seem to be true. Um, the most famous one, of course, is what's the difference between a hijacker and a terrorist, and a, and a um, liturgist? And you, the answer is you can negotiate with a hijacker. I mean, not with a liturgist. <laughs> now, I, I think that's probably often true. However, I, I do like Catholics, I do love the sacred liturgy, and I do enjoy a frank exchange of views. So I'm looking forward to sharing some thoughts with you. I'll only say, in addition to that, that I celebrate the Roman Rite in both the ordinary and extraordinary forms, according to the customs and usages of my order. So I'm a Normandy, or pre attention. Um, so we go back to the 12th century, and the last edition of the proper missile of the order was 1936. So that gives you some uh, idea. We run two parishes in Chelmsford, so I say the new mass in English as well. I won't uh, make you guess which I prefer to say, probably <laughs> obvious, but uh, I'm going to explain why that's not really the point I think. So I am honored to be here to show you some thoughts on the theology of the mass, uh, but it was perhaps audacious for me to accept. Now you've had some brilliant speakers already, um, particularly Father Michael Lang, whose work I really enjoy reading, a wonderful scholar, and, and, but all of them have been great. And in fact, I've been lucky enough to listen to them all on YouTube, because uh, I wasn't able to be here in person, and uh, so I was able to hear everything the others said. So I hope to complement in some way uh, what has already been said as part of this series. So thanks for that. That's rather good. And I, I thought there at the time, our Lord said, what you whisper in private rooms will be proclaimed from the housetops. And I just wonder whether the Good News translation of the Bible will put it for the 21st century, what you say in private rooms will appear on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> very careful about that. Uh, I'm more used to preaching, I'll say that as well, I'm more used to preaching and edifying talks rather than being academic, so I'm not very used to giving my opinions. Um, so I hope you can distinguish when I present the theology of the church. It's not my opinion, that's hopefully uh, what the church gives us. It's Catholic theology of the mass. But I will then go on to some issues which do involve my own opinions and some of the areas of controversy and problem that we face in the church today. Um, whether you're a Catholic or not, I hope you find it edifying. Now, this is theology of the mass part one. Part two will be given by the brilliant Sebastian Morello. Um, and we have been in touch a little bit to ensure that we give you a fair overview of the subject. So I'm not going to treat it exhaustively tonight. You will have part two to come. As a Thomist and a great philosopher, he's going to explore the theological treasures of the Mass as sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, victim, of nation, priest, and various other things. I'm sure he'll mention a lot more than that. Um, anything connected directly with that, I'll try and, 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 and not address um, completely to give him uh, plenty to talk about, but that, of course there is an enormous amount we can talk about when it comes to the theology of the Mass. Uh, so in a way he's chosen the better part and it shan't be taken from him. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the action of Christ in his Holy Mass. His supreme act of worship of the Father 
and ours, through him, with him, and in him. So I'm going to firstly set a few theological parameters for tonight's talk. They're all important, so don't hear them as coming in any particular order. But first of all, the Mass is the sacrifice made present. The Mass is an act of offering and adoration, which, to quote one of the more beautiful phrases of the recent Council, is the source and summit of the Christian life, which makes present upon our altars and in our midst the real presence of our Saviour, body, blood, soul, and divinity. The Mass is the representation of his sacrifice on Calvary. So consequently, we adore him as we see his body lifted up and offered to the Father on the altar of the cross. We witness then the shedding of his blood as we symbolically separate the blood from his body in the consecration of the chalice. We witness his death. And at the fraction of the host and then the placing of peace within the chalice, the reuniting of his body and blood, we witness his resurrection and his gift of peace to us breathing upon us the Holy Spirit. And then comes the moment where we approach the altar to receive from his hands the gift of himself to us. His flesh is food indeed, and his blood is drink indeed, and he calls us to a deep communion with him in his mysteries. It's one that we can make physically and sacramentally, if we are able, which crowns the spiritual union with him, which our celebration of the Mass has effected. In other words, the Mass unites the one event of his passion, death, and resurrection, from Holy Thursday to Easter morning, if you like, in one act of divine worship. The worship of the Father by the Son in the Holy Spirit, and our worship of the Blessed Trinity in union with Christ, who offers himself and intercedes on our behalf. No other act of worship on earth is greater than this memorial sacrifice, the Holy Mass. Put it in more human terms for a minute. Nothing we could ever do is more sublime than to offer the Mass. If I said Mass only once in my whole life, that would be the greatest moment of my life. If indeed I attended Mass only once, there'd be nothing else to equal that moment in my whole life. If I received Holy Communion but once, nothing except heaven itself would come close to that sacramental union with God. Because the Mass is heaven united to earth, God united to man, man joining in the prayer of Christ and the song of the angels. I love angels, let's think about them for a minute. Our guardian angels bow in adoration when we receive Holy Communion, because no such privilege will ever be given them. And yet, to me, a weak, flawed sinner, very unworthy in every sense, to us is given that privilege. Imagine that. Add to that the dignity of the priesthood to be configured to Christ and to be him while standing at the altar. And I hope you can easily imagine how if we could perceive more clearly the reality of what we do through sacramental signs, we would be too terrified to approach the altar, whether layman or cleric. Second point on this idea of the sacrament. I think that is exactly what God's mercy towards us is, that we are invited to approach and participate in the Mass. The sacramental veil is what enables us to enter the Holy of Holies and stand before his presence, a presence before which Moses covered his face and took off his shoes. For Christ is present in the Eucharist really, truly, and substantially, as the Council of Trent affirmed. The sacraments are signs and symbols, but they're not merely signs and symbols. And that the Church would insist upon that a great deal when combating Protestantism. The sacraments convey a real grace. This is not a symbolic meal, end of story. They convey a real grace. And the Eucharist is known as the Blessed Sacrament because it is the reality it signifies. It is Christ's body. And blood, not just a symbol of it, it is that. Now, I'll let um, Sebastian talk a bit more, if he wants to, about transubstantiation and the Thomist idea of that miracle as it takes place. But let it suffice to say here that the Blessed Sacrament is the real presence of Christ, who makes himself present on the altar through sacramental signs. If we look at it, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist 
is one of substance, so it's on a metaphysical level. On the physical level, the accidents, as um, the scholastics would call it, the accidents of bread and wine, what it looks like and tastes like, they remain for our sacramental reception of his body and blood. But it's not mere bread that we receive, it is his body and his blood, his soul and his divinity. So the sacrament of the Eucharist exists to bring that presence to us that we might receive and adore, rather the other way round, adore and receive. In a sense, if the Eucharist were not a sacramentum, a mysterion in Greek, a mystery, a sacrament, then Christ wouldn't be present in it at all. After all, his risen and glorified body is in heaven, at the right hand of the Father. We certainly don't eat away at a piece of Jesus in Holy Communion. It's not some kind of feasting on a corpse. It's certainly not some sort of cannibalistic rite, as many in the early church who opposed Christianity held. It's a sacrament by which Christ, and this is wonderful to say this in this place, Christ in an act of humility that Father Faber would describe as even more sublime than his first incarnation. He comes down and makes himself present under the form of bread and wine for us to adore him and receive it in every tabernacle, on every altar in the Catholic world. And it's in this sacrament that he most clearly keeps his promise to us, for lo, I am with you always, to the close of the age. Last line of Matthew's Gospel. So it's his real presence before which the angels bow and hell trembles that we're talking about. And so would we tremble if we could, were not for the sacramental veil that allows us to approach him. But he says to us, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. And I'm going to insist then that the communion or the banquet aspect of the Mass cannot ever be separated from the sacrificial aspect. Nor can our eating be separated from our adoring in the Mass. And this is a good quote on this by the then Cardinal Ratzinger. I quote, So let no one say the Eucharist is for eating, not looking at. It's not ordinary bread, as the most ancient traditions constantly emphasize. Eating it is a spiritual process involving the whole man. Eating it means worshipping it. Thus, adoration is not opposed to communion, nor is it merely added to it. No, in fact, communion only reaches its true depths when it is supported by adoration. And we'll return to that a little later on when we look at various problems that arise in the Mass today. The third kind of parameter I want to bring before we move on uh, is divine worship. The fact that this is the act of adoration of the Father by Christ his Son. The Mass brings to earth the cosmic liturgy of heaven. It mirrors the adoration of the slain Lamb in the book of the Apocalypse. The other great scriptural thing we must ground our theological understanding of this worship of God in the Mass with is our, the words of our Blessed Lord to the Samaritan woman at the well. It's an event symbolically rich in meaning, and it has been much abused and misunderstood, particularly by Karl Rahner, actually. I was reading that just this morning in Father Michael Lang's new book. Uh, it's often been misunderstood, but let's, let's use this as a great starting point too. Christ says to the woman at the well in Samaria, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will show us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Our offering of the Mass is the true worship of God in spirit and in truth, spiritually and really. We adore God the Father through Christ our Lord. The Mass then exists to communicate to us the salvation won for us by Christ on Calvary. To put very simply, and to summarise in a way everything I've just laid out, the Mass exists 
for the salvation of souls. And really that consideration we've got to keep at the forefront of our minds with everything else I'm, I'm going to consider tonight. The Mass is there to save souls. We cooperate with Christ in his saving passion, death and resurrection, and we are united to him in his act of salvation. But the only reason the Church offers the Mass, the only reason Catholics attend Mass, is for the salvation of souls. There's and everybody else's. Full stop. Might as well go and sit down now. <laughs> that's really what I get. That's, that's the kind of theological branch of your life. <coughs> Moving on a bit then. The church's greatest duty and her greatest <coughs> treasure is to celebrate the sacred mysteries, to use that phrase of the early church, the sacred mysteries. So to speak of them, even in an academic setting like this, right, or even from a pulpit, is a mystagogical endeavour as well as a theological one, or as a theological one. We approach with some awe and trembling this great mysterion, mystery of our salvation. The presence of Christ among us, the worship of the Almighty. Now everything you've heard already in this series of lectures has illustrated, I think, how this mystery of Emmanuel, God with us, is celebrated by the Church in every age. How all our efforts at singing and building poetry and praise are an attempt, at times successful, at times less so, to appreciate this treasure that we hold in vessels of clay. The rites and forms of our worship, the character of our buildings and sacred spaces, the quality of our music and iconography, and so on, they're the vehicles of the tradition that we have received, vehicles that still speak to us uh, of the mystery at the heart of our worship. And this tradition, stretches back to the Apostles, who received the command from the Lord himself, do this in memory of me. So St. Paul could say, in a passage where he regulates the liturgy as celebrated by the Corinthians, he says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and so on. goes through the last supper narrative. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now the sacred rites are at the heart of this apostolic tradition which we've received down the ages. The externals, the liturgical accidents, if you will, are like instruments on which this great symphony of salvation is played to delight our senses and enliven us to devotion and to worship. But what we do in the Mass because it's what Christ is doing for us, is not an ordinary event. It is a transcendent reality. Now, this also is, uh, must be said from the start. The earliest authors, as you heard in the first lecture, um, attest to the sacramental presence of Christ in the Eucharist by differentiating our worship from ordinariness and emphasizing the spiritual and the theological nature of the Mass. And I think Father Lang and Father Newby pointed out quite clearly that the idea of even the earliest celebrations of the Mass, house Mass <coughs> in people's homes, have often been misunderstood by recent scholars who I think would rather like us all to believe that the early Christians were very relaxed about this sacred meal. And the evidence, architectural and literary, uh, as they explain, shows quite the opposite. The Eucharist was not at all thought of as ordinary. I might add that if it were, the Romans would hardly have had any cause to suspect these private gatherings of Christians. There were other private gatherings of the Mithraic cult met in secret of all kinds of strange, dodgy rituals, and they were all tolerated by the Roman establishment. Christians, on the other hand, guarded these mysteries with great care. They refused to participate in state religion, the uh, worship of idols, and so they were immediately under suspicion. And there's never been in the church, in my view, a relaxed attitude to the Eucharist. So when it comes in, it's very dangerous. It's a, it's a great innovation. And we can see this from the very earliest sources. I've already quoted St. Paul. He had this to say in the letter to the Corinthians, first letter to the Corinthians as well. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a communion in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? St. Justin Martyr was quoted as well, but I 
you've just got to quote this. He shows that Christians are initiated into these mysteries they celebrate, and therefore they do so knowingly and reverently. Wonderful passage here from St. Justin. This food is called among us Eucharistia, Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true, and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins and unto regeneration, and who is so living as Christ has enjoined. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Saviour, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. That's Justin Martin about the year 150. Now the fact that Justin included that in his famous apologia should strike us immediately, as well as an attempt to convince the would-be persecutors of the early church that is of unthreatening nature of Christianity, it's also a courageous affirmation of the belief of the early church in the face of ridicule and, and misunderstanding. And like all Catholic truth, it would indeed prove to be a danger to the pagan empire. If it wasn't true, then it was as harmless to the establishment as the cult of Midlands. But if it is true, then this is an idea that could soon set the world on fire and change it forever. And it has. So, whizzing ahead across two millennia to us here. Here we are. We're the current receivers of the tradition handed down by the apostles, safeguarded by their success the bishops of the Catholic Church. The Mass is still here, in spite of so many persecutions and the hardened attempts of so many to eradicate it, and some of those attempts are still being made today, as we know, in various different places. Was there ever a time, I wonder, when the Christian church was not in some sort of crisis? Now, today people talk of a crisis meaning the particular challenges and the obstacles to the faith that exist in our own day, from within the church as much as from without it. Limiting ourselves to the theological challenges facing the church regarding the mass Let's look at some of those in the light of what we've said. Now, there's no doubt about it. You can't really have listened to the other lectures without getting a sense of it, that the church has been through a really turbulent period of liturgical reform in recent years. And at the heart of that crisis is the much controverted issue of the reform of the mass. We still have it, but not in the form we had it once, if you like. Now, this shouldn't surprise us, but the mass is the heart of the church's life. It was obviously going to be a battleground, given the differing attitudes towards its reform that existed throughout the 20th century, and particularly during and after the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. However, I will say this. While there have been some truly dark episodes in the last 50 years, I do think, and I hope some of you agree with me, that some light and hope is now dawning. These are happier times for the Mass. You'll recall from the history of the Mass lectures that, uh, particularly Father Robbie's, that much of the movement for reform of the liturgy in the last century stems from what we call the liturgical movement and reached its apogee in the years immediately preceding the Council. And this has begun in the 19th century and uh, we'll skip it here because we talked uh, in all the other lectures about how one movement of revivalism reaction to against another, to another, and so on. Um, it comes obviously out of a kind of neo-Gothic uh, movement, and romanticism is all there in the 19th century, revival of the faith, of the faith, uh, what we call the counter-enlightenment, counter-revolutionary movements, there comes a revival of Christianity, and a revival of interest in our heritage, particularly liturgical, there's a revival of Gregorian chant, <laughs> schools, or plain song for schools, they're all part of that movement. Uh, and then there was the, the revival movements in architecture as well, which you've been, you've been introduced to. And one thing I mentioned as well is the contemporaneous with that paleological discoveries, particularly for our purposes, the catacombs in Rome. That, of course, once they were discovered and explored and, and um, more, in, more and more interest grew in them, um, a kind of interest grew in the early artistic forms uh, of the church too. Um, I think, you know, you can see the result of this. <coughs> the fact that by the 1950s, priests were wearing 
uh, semi-Gothic chasubles, heavily adapted from their original form, I might say, and emblazoned with Cairo motifs and all that. It's a very clear kind of result of these discoveries, these interests that were going on. Now, I don't mean to be too simplistic, but this isn't really my topic. So, but what I really want to say is, um, you know, it, all of these movements are reactions against others, but what was peculiar about the liturgical movement, what was going on around it, was this desire to find what was simple and authentic about the Roman tradition. Um, and then this idea of the return to the sources sort of becomes very trendy. And it's in the context of um, artistic modernism and minimalism in the secular sphere, um, and people want something simple and authentic. What is authentic then about the Roman rites? And one aspect of which, of course, appealed a lot was the venerable age and tradition um, of our Roman rites. What were the oldest bits? And some true scholars that are still the best to find today uh, wrote in this period, you know, on, on, on that kind of subject. But the aggiornamento, which would then happen, um, once that takes over, the sort of venerable age of our rites is all seen as embarrassingly complex and repetitive, not particularly authentic, and certainly not fit for a modern age. But while belief and appreciation of the content, if you like, were made high, in most places at least, the mass was a real battleground as discussions of its form continued to ferment in ecclesiastical circles. But what was at stake was something truly immense, an uninterrupted tradition from the apostles, a mass that's only been minimally reformed since the time of Pope St. Gregory the Great, the Latin language too, that was at stake as well, of course, because popular understanding of the liturgy saw, was seen as a priority, and that included some use of vernacular languages. It failed really to take into consideration the fact that the mass on the eve of the council was as popular as ever. Um, and for ordinary lay people, um, the reforms, quite substantial, that were made by Pius X and Pius XII, uh, didn't really affect the lay people that much. Uh, the breviary didn't affect the lay people. They'd actually been encouraged to come to Mass more, receive communion more frequently. Um, the Holy Week ceremonies changed all that. People did start to notice that that was very, very different. You know, before that, change the calendar, tweak a rubric here, there, and everywhere. That really has little effect on the ordinary lay faithful. Um, but this caused a stir. And of course, the fact that the 1955 Holy Week revisions happened at all gave a kind of zealous reforming party in Rome in particular the hope of still more further radical changes. Now, I hope it doesn't sound too conceited because we're, we're here you know, with the great benefit of hindsight. And uh, you know, I was born long after the council talking about all this. But I think there is a point of hope that I see today regarding the Mass that for my generation, and many of us here, we're not really burdened by the baggage of the conciliar reform. We can see it for what it is. Now, when I was a boy, one of my favourite books at home was a three-volume set published in the 50s called The Catholic Book of Knowledge. One of the bound in white leatherette. <coughs> Mum probably still has it somewhere. And there was a chapter in it entitled The Mass in Modern Times. And it was very much a product of the liturgical movement. But if I read The Mass in Modern Times, there were pictures of John XXIII being carried around for his papal coronation. High Mass in Westminster Cathedral in a kind of double technicolor spread in the middle. It was so odd and unfamiliar to me being brought up in an orderly parish in every sense. I only came to see why it was different as a teenager. A separate talk, I imagine, the rest of that story. But we see a clear difference between the liturgy as it's celebrated in most parish churches of the world and how it's celebrated in places that are in continuity with that tradition. Here at the Oratory is one good example. It's fair to point out that these differences have always existed, that to some extent there has always been a difference between metropolitan liturgy and provincial liturgy. Um, and I think, really, places like the cathedral here, Spanish place, the origin, they might only seem like ivory towers compared with suburban and rural parishes with more limited resources and solemnity. But there is a, a, a big kind of change happening there now as sort of priests can come out of the woodwork and really restore solemnity in those places. But we also see the bigger, clearer difference that people of our generation see is the difference between the ordinary form and the extraordinary form, between the old rite 
and a new one. We perceive, in other words, a rupture. And it's to repair this that Pope Benedict inspired a new, what he called a hermeneutic of continuity, as the phrase has come, uh, to help the church in our times. And uh, if we jump ahead, you know, to where we are now, looking back at the, the conciliar reform, we can see that we live in what other people have called it, the period of a new liturgical movement, a period of rediscovery of the tradition of the Roman rite, that would probably make the conciliar reformers shudder, and I think would make most of the council fathers rather pleased. I, I imagine some of them probably prayed for this day from beyond the grave. We benefit too from the wisdom of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, whose theological preeminence lies precisely in St. Christian, who in 2007 liberated the old rites to give them parity with the Reformed liturgy. So we can look back easily and see that Pius XII, in Mediato Day 1947, picked out a lot of problems that we see now, and his warnings weren't really listened to. But we can also see that since the Council, a reform of the reform movement has been gathering pace um, in the pontificates of John and Paul II and of Pope Benedict. Those documents come out as sort of correct abuses and uh, end experimentation and innovations of all sorts. But I think this is the time, it seems to me now, for a really open and honest look at these things by the bishops and priests of the church, openly. I think for far too long, anyone who critiqued the liturgical reform uh, was seen as anathema by the hierarchy. I think that is changing slowly. Perhaps because it was still seen as a work in progress um, or part of the experiment, they just hoped that bitter people would sort of disappear. But I think that's all changed now. Um, People see also the fact that many priests and lay faithful, in particular, have suffered because of the substantial changes to the Mass. Um, after all, the seminaries of institutes that exclusively use the old right are all full. Um, again, I would say the priests, uh, such as myself, who celebrate both forms, don't really have a theological um, agenda to peddle, which is motivated more or less by the simple zeal to save souls and bring them to the truth of the faith in its fullness while continuing to pass on the tradition that we've received. So I do think that uh, these, are, these are good times. And to look at some of the actual issues and problems then, um, briefly, I'm probably going on far too long. The principle we must bear in mind is that old friend, Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. But it seems to me, if we're going to begin to look at various of these problems, that the crisis in the church today is a crisis of faith, uh, both in the sense of fides quae and fides qua, as the church refers to them. There are threats to the content of the faith, fides quae, certainly, but there's also complete ignorance of true doctrine in many quarters. I can see that as a primary school chaplain, as a curate in two busy parishes. There's a lot of gaps in people's knowledge. There's also a crisis of fides qua. There's also a crisis of the virtue of faith in the sense that people, um, although I'm sure they're affected by the secularism and moral, moral relativism around them, uh, they don't often seek the virtue of faith from God. It's a gift of God. Um, it's often challenged or it's not even asked for at all. And so there's a great thirst for the faith, which shows this you know, uh, very, very clearly. Um, the principle, as you probably know, is important, lex orandi, lex credendi, because it demonstrates that the how of our worship has a direct effect on what we believe, and the other way around. Our prayer informs our faith, just as our faith informs our prayer. So if the form of our prayer changes, then what we believe can become challenged, obscured, or changed altogether, but we seem to. Um, while the Church's faith in the Mass, officially, and what it, what it means has not changed at all, um, that's not the impression you might get. Uh, from examining the Reformed liturgy as it is celebrated in some places. Um, so just as you've seen how music, art and architecture can have a positive or a negative effect on the faith and devotion of the congregation, so changes to the liturgical rites um, have had an effect, and it's not altogether good either, we have to say. So we have to also have another principle in mind, I think, to look at these things today, and that is to try, don't ask me, exactly how, it's something I'd really like to think about a bit more, but how we think with the mind of the church in continuity with her tradition. What's best for her faithful now? 
And what does she desire for us? And what then is the best law of prayer to harmonise with her law of belief? So we do need to look beyond, in a sense, the personal preferences of individuals to see the essential purpose of the Mass, which is the salvation of souls. So what would best help souls today? Um, the first issue I'm going to look at, I'm going to do these quite briefly, because I know I don't want to go on for far too long. Um, I'm always told off in terms of preaching too long. But I'm going to look at Holy Communion, because this affects faith, the faithful most. And since we started off with a great theological, theological thing about the real presence, let's look at this. There's been a kind of weakening of people's belief in the Blessed Sacrament across the Roman Rite. So there has been a change in the Lex Credendi in some places, uh, on account of various innovations, the Lex Arandi. Um, four things, really. The main issues, it seems to me, are reception of communion in the hand, reception of communion while standing, the reception of communion under both species, and the distribution of communion by extraordinary ministers. Now, I don't have time to go into them all in detail, but I think uh, all of them in some way have had a negative effect, as well as on devout souls, it must be said, um, either an indifferent effect or a, or a good effect. Um, the reason that they do is that they don't really convey well the fullness of the Church's belief in what the Mass is and what the Blessed Sacrament is. So in very obvious kind of terms, if Protestants kneel to receive what is to the Catholic mind purely a symbolic wafer, then why should Catholics not kneel to receive the body of the Lord? If Holy Communion is Christ feeding us, then why do lay people uh, assist with its distribution? Am I fed by Christ through the holy orders of his priests, uh, or am I fed by Mrs. Jones and Mr. Smith? <laughs> and if I am fed in Holy Communion by Christ himself, then why ought I to take the host myself or hold the chalice myself? If the chalice is presented to me as containing his blood, then am I missing out by only receiving the body of Christ? So these innovations, uh, many of them brought in not by the will of the Council Fathers at all, but by the disobedience, which has now been sanctioned, of many clerics, they've had a disastrous effect in some cases. Now, devout souls have coped with them bravely, but the simple faith of many, many people has been eroded by some of these innovations. And I think now really is the time for the Church to really state clearly that there is a better way, in spite of what is currently permitted, and that is to simply restore and retain uh, the traditional practice of receiving Holy Communion, kneeling and on the tongue and under one kind, one kind at the hands of a priest or a deacon. Um, it is, in a sense, the law. Uh, other things are now allowed by permission. I think we need to focus on that too. Uh, there's a reason why it developed as normative. Now, I do understand that this involves um, crossing into other boundaries. It, you'll need altar rails for this to really work, and you have to overcome various other ideological barriers. Um, we talked about that in the architecture lectures, didn't you, about having a boundary and threshold and you know, delving into the architecture of the sanctuary to make this work. Um, if you want to read more about it, Athanasius Schneider, Athanasius Schneider, Bishop Schneider, is a wonderful leading voice on this in his book, Darwin Says. But I want to signal another one, in fact, too, which was uh, another bishop. Juan Rodolfo Laise of San Luis in Argentina, who wrote a book um, which first appeared in Spanish uh, called Communion in the Hand, Documents and History, in which he calmly states this, well, this is what he said, it's wonderful. Um, he says, the history of the reintroduction of Communion in the Hand is nothing other than the triumph of an act of disobedience. And I think we need to wake up to that. Really. Now, secondly, let's look at uh, the other sort of Battleground, a difficult one here. Um, Actuosa participatio, whatever it means, however you translate it. No, I'm not going to get there. But it's something, it's been something you've, interested, you've been introduced to before, it's been mentioned in some of the other lectures. Now, undeniably, the faithful participate in the Mass. But how they do so has changed a great deal. And one of the problems currently facing us is this. Now, St. Pius X is quoted as having said, Don't pray at Mass, pray the Mass. And that's admirable, of course, in every sense. But it seems to me that congregations that said the rosary or read their missals while the liturgy was celebrated were far from being non-participative in the Mass. There's no real contradiction there. Um, 
Now, regrettably, something about the new liturgy which is annoying uh, is that it fills silence with words. Someone quipped uh, that a long time ago the word became flesh, and much, <laughs> much later priests have put it back into words again. And I think this is so <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> There's so many words in the new mass, and there's a danger that an overuse of scriptural variety, um, which by the way completely changes what the purpose of scripture is in the mass, uh, from what the church always thought it was, we'll come back to that later if you like, um, it's, it's, it really appeals only to a sort of intellectual worshipper, really. And arguably the overuse of the vernacular has really caused the same problem. Um, I think in spite of the Mass being widely celebrated in vernacular languages, people seem to understand its meaning less than when it was in Latin. Um, someone who played to me in the parish, they didn't understand the word consubstantial uh, when it appears in the Creed, in the, in the revised English translation. They said, we don't use that word anyway. And why didn't we just keep of one being with the Father, as we had before? And I was happy to explain why. But I asked whether he understood what was really meant by the phrase of one being with the Father. But he didn't. <laughs> now that's, you know, it doesn't matter what language is in if you don't understand the content. I think perhaps the fact that there's so much vernacular language used has made our catechesis lazy. Anyway, there is some hope, I think, even here on the matter of devotions because they are on the rise a lot more. Uh, I had other things to say on that, but I'll skip through them. Um, the Mass certainly could be more conducive to private prayer if it were less wordy or awe-inspiring. And uh, I think the music lectures also mentioned that silence, as much as good music, can have a huge part to play in that. More broadly, it's encouraging that beauty, properly understood, is making a comeback as well. The quality of vestments of art, of iconography and architecture is gradually increasing now in reaction to the kind of postmodernist wasteland we've all lived through. And certainly young people, when I go to secondary schools at the moment, they're not inspired by 1970s and 80s beige, but they do appreciate a kind of raised tone in church, in contrast to the increasing uh, popularization of everything around the materialist um, structures around them. They don't want the church to be conformed to the world, they want the church to be other, to be transcendent and secure and uh, eternal in a sense. They want it to be a place of certainty, um, where there's so much doubt and manipulation and spin around music. And they, they want to know what to believe and how to believe it. The inner sense uh, that they have of right or wrong has, has not disappeared, even though it's challenged. And they do really want to make that transition between childhood and adulthood smoothly and confidently. Now, liturgy designed principally for children becomes unbearable to teenagers. I know, because I was one of them. And, and, and so was Peter, we were in the same school. And, and uh, if that's all that's offered to them, then they soon sense infantilization, they vote with their feet. Um, Cardinal Sara has an interesting thing to bring to our reflections on this. Wonderful man, I think. Did love that book he's just published. Do read it if you haven't. Um, he spoke about the contrast between the material poverty of the so-called developing world, sorry, the, yes, that's right, the material poverty of the so-called developing world, uh, compared with the spiritual poverty of the so-called developed world. And, and um, this should really urge us to think uh, more seriously about this. Uh, we're surrounded by materialistic wealth, but we can also see that there's a spiritual impoverishment around us. Carl Sarah doesn't like campaigns like Make Poverty History, because poverty is a good thing in the, in, the, in the Christian sense. He wants us to make destitution history, you know, but to be poor, to be poor in spirit, is a beatitude. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So many might be cash rich, but destitute in spirit. Now, when, the, when it comes to the Mass, this was addressed in the 19th century by Catholics, and we have to say by Anglo-Catholics as well, who are a fine example in the sense they brought liturgical splendor to the most economically deprived places. And, and a glorious liturgy or, belongs to the whole church. And that's something we must think about too. But the, although we, the contrast is between the metropolitan and the provincial has grown uh, larger, you know, the people of Stepney have as much right to it as the people of Mayfair. 
And uh, I have to say, many good priests are turning that corner by doing wonders for the faith and restoring some beauty and some solemnity to their parishes. And they, they are much to be commended and imitated. They face a lot of challenges, it's not these that there's no money around it. I'm going to speak lastly from a priest's perspective, and I hesitate here. I can only really speak for myself. Firstly, from the priest's own faith and experience at the altar, and secondly, whatever might be his own preferences. Now, many of the problems I've illustrated are unavoidable, in a sense, for me. I, we face them, we put up with them, in a sense, for the salvation, of, for the sake of souls, for their salvation, um, while encouraging people to a better understanding of things and accompanying them to appreciate and love and know and sometimes discover for the first time their tradition. So within that context, context the new writer Mass is, is certainly a struggle sometimes. Now, um, one issue brilliantly exposed by Father Lang is of orientation, whether the priest faces the people or whether they all, priests and people, face East or face God. Um, this is an issue for the faithful too, because it's quite a different thing to assist at one or the other. Um, I find that when the priest, and I face the people, you, 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 there's a danger that you fall naturally into the role of a compare if you're not careful. Um, and the constant speaking aloud of everything perpetuates that sense. So I would say that I find it much easier to pray facing the other way, and certainly much easier to pray in the extraordinary form. It's not just a question of language, it's a question of gesture and orientation. So these things are important. We recognise the presence of Christ more a certain way that we really need to think about it. Um, there are certain other aspects of the Reformed liturgy that are a strain on the theology of priesthood as well. Um, if I'm facing people all the time, it is harder to remember that I'm principally talking to God uh, and, not, and only to them as his intermediary. Oh yes, the practice of consideration too, massive problem. Um, because um, assisting inquiry now is coming back. And, uh, and this is part of the kind of hope that I want to paint you. But, uh, but this problem of consideration, and the, the insistence on it everywhere, is, is widespread Eastern lights, but it really only parodies them. And uh, it's also introduced to emphasize the unity of priesthood, but um, I can't really see that. But it's an innovation, really, in the Roman Rite, which weakens the theology of priesthood. I know that very, 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 very rarely can celebrate. Uh, it never really feels like you said mass at all. It's not that I don't believe it. It's just that the law of prayer seems to be in conflict with the law of belief. And uh, so we're back to Lex Romani Lex Quidendi. Um, particularly in some monasteries, I know. Uh, certainly not my own, but in some monasteries where they have consideration all the time. It means that some priests rarely preside at Mass at all, and that can't be good. And the great benefits to, of course, assisting at a conventional Mass as we have in our academy and saying or in private Mass or all public Mass each day. Now, to drift into the other point I want to mention, which is priests' preferences, I have tried to remain somewhat objective, but let's admit, of course, that the subjective also plays a part. Um, the Mass can differ so much from one parish to another, from one city and country to another, that it often ends up being the Mass as Father likes it. He will go to one parish instead of to another. Father says a nice Mass there. I suspect it's always been the case to some extent, um, particularly when it comes to the sermon, but the Church has created a situation where the liturgical speaker, there are so many options to choose from in the Missal, that the Mass can quite legitimately be different in one place from another. It's far from ideal, but that's what we've got. And I think we need to aim at the Mass as the Church wants it, because that's what, or certainly ought to be, uh, the Mass as God wants it. That's easier said than done. <coughs> does the Church, for example, this is an important question for us, does the Church want us all to worship identically, or does she want us to embrace variety? And I think paradoxically, it's only really in the wake of Vatican II that this notion of a unified liturgy across the church was really raised as a practical possibility. Because before the council there had always existed legitimate variation of rites. Um, even at Trent, um, with the printing of a Roman Missal, there were still allowances made for diocesan monastic and ritual variation, which had the uh, merit of, of, of venerable years and tradition behind them. So rather than encouraging that sort of variation, the post-conciliar reform has made everyone do pretty much the same thing. 
religious orders have ended up abandoning their particular uses, and regional variations have all but disappeared. But things are changing now. Orders are rediscovering the richness of their different traditions. Um, and things, more things can be done to, to recognize this legitimate variation that could exist. Uh, with the new freedom afforded to the traditional rites, um, there's a new mix of old and new, sanctioned by the church and encouraged by her. And in the midst of this, efforts have been made in recent years to rediscover the richness of our tradition even before um, the uh, reforms uh, such as Pius XII's in 1955. We've attempted in the Latin Rite to grasp in our tradition and make it a present reality today. And I think, in, in a sense, in the midst of what seems like endless variety elsewhere, I think that's an opportunity not to be missed. The variety of music, art, and architecture still abounds, and so should liturgical variety, legitimate liturgical variety as well. There is sometimes, as a slightly defensive idea, pre present in some, by no means all, traditionalist circles, um, in favour of, sort of uniformity, going back to whatever date they choose, and all looking like and wearing praying exactly like exactly the same thing. I think that's a bit dangerous. But the important thing is that we continue to celebrate the old form, the extraordinary form, like all old forms, to allow a sense of balance to return to the liturgical life of the church. I think that's what the Pope really wanted. And in that sense, uh, we might capture a sense of the integrity of the rite as it, as it expresses our, our faith. Uh, just give a little bit here. Yeah, so I'll finish on that. The fact that so many, Alpin Reed talks about the organic development of liturgy. We've had so many unorganic reforms, in a sense, that we do need to think uh, in terms of continuity and in terms of uh, organic development. The fact that, that there is organic development is because our tradition isn't dead, it's alive. It's something living. And uh, I found this the other day, of all places, on Facebook. It's oddly attributed both to Thomas More and Gustav Mahler. If anyone knows exactly where he's from, let me know. But it's such a jewel. Tradition is not the veneration of ashes, but the preservation of fire. Wonderful, I thought. If anyone finds it, how's it going? So, to wind up, let me restate that the theology of the Mass is a constant reminder of the essence of the Eucharistic sacrifice, even amid a turbulent period of ritual reform marked by some rupture. Our tradition is still there to be appreciated and received, and Pope Benedict really is the one who's given us a theological framework for this by stating very clearly that the old and new rites of Mass are, quote, these two expressions of the Church's lex orandi will in no way lead to a division in the Church's lex credendi, for they are two usages of the one Roman rite. <coughs> He pointed out that the old form had never been juridically abrogated and consequently in principle was always permitted. So he's the Pope of liturgical continuity. He pointed out that the conti this uh, continuity, in famous terms, he stated this, what earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too, and it cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden or even considered harmful. It behooves all of us to preserve the riches which have developed in the church's faith and prayer and to give them their proper place. And that's a wonderful passage. I'm sure it will go down in history as one of his most important papal pronouncements. And it's an indication that the church wishes the riches of her liturgical tradition to be a vehicle for sanctification. What was holy still is holy and can still make us holy today. If the Mass exists primarily for the salvation of souls, then so does our tradition. The Mass is at the heart of what has been handed down to us from the Apostles. So I would say that what we should do now is not embrace the zeitgeist of our particular age, and as any particular age, but rather to interpret and embrace tradition as we have received it, and to present it to the faithful of our time, young and old, and presenting to them a sense of their liturgical heritage, and of its contemporary value and importance for their salvation, uh, while presenting to God the worship and adoration which is his due in spirit and in truth. Let's remember too that what we embrace and do now will be what is considered tradition in a hundred years' time, part of.
So I'm going to conclude with some words of Bishop, uh, the Bishop, uh, St. Gaudensius, which I found the other day in the brief remarks. It's his will that his gifts should remain among us. It was his will that the souls which he had redeemed by his precious blood should continue to be sanctified by sharing the pattern of his own passion. For this reason, he appointed his faithful disciples the first priests of his church and enjoined them never to cease to perform the mysteries of eternal life. These mysteries must be celebrated by every priest in every church in the world until Christ comes again from heaven, so that we priests, together with the congregation of the faithful, may have the example of Christ's passion daily before our eyes, hold it in our hands, and even receive it in our mouths and in our hearts, and so keep undimmed the memory of our redemption. Escape, all of you, from the domination of Egypt and Pharaoh, I mean the devil, and join us in receiving this sacrifice of the saving past with all the eagerness of a religious heart, so that the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who we believe to be present in his sacraments, may sanctify our inmost hearts, for the power of this sacrifice is beyond worth and endures forever. really lies on a very basic human level, which is that priests don't much like the new mass if they're quite liturgically formed and minded. And really the reform the reform is because good people try to do the new mass well. And I think if you look at it from the point of view of a priest who is able to tweak and reform and improve in his parish, because many priests are not, for whatever reason, because there's liturgy run by a committee, or because the bishop won't let him, or whatever, or religious superior might not let him in some cases. Where a priest is free to do that, he's, if he's well formed liturgically and is, is keen to think about these things, he will probably want to improve it. And I think that's really where it stems from. So I don't think it's dead because it will always happen. What's my opinion? I say the new mass for the salvation of souls. That's my opinion. <laughs> I try and do it as traditionally as I can. But, not to make it theatre, but because I, as a priest, need some help with it. Um, but I, I think uh, what the mind of the church really is it needs to be rediscovered for today. I wouldn't be any more controversial than that. Because, you know, I say that I, I, I have the care of souls in my parish um, for whom anything else at the moment would, would not work. And we have to bring people uh, with us. Someone explained this very well when they wanted to join our order and uh, they were looking at the Norbertines from Chelmsford, but they were also looking at orders that exclusively use the old right or congregations institutes that do so. And uh, he eventually ended up trying or joining 
one of those. And we, 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 we got on with him quite well, and we were happy to encourage him in that part. But he came back and said something extraordinary that I've never forgotten. He said, it's as if the communities that only use the old forms, in a sense, are drawing the church back to a rich tradition and saying, look, here it is. And uh, those of us that do both are pushing from the other side. Well, there it is. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a charming view. And I think, in a way, we're not pushing anyone towards a, a museum piece or, or some, whatever idea of history about. We're moving people to Christ. We're bringing people to Him. The Mass is His. And if it looks like it isn't, then there's a problem. And so, in a sense, there's a push and a pull, which I think all part of how the church works. And I think that really is what's going on. I think the, I think the new right will continue to be... Uh, the one, one other thing I might mention on that is what's often mentioned with regard to the new liberation uh, given to the old rights is the idea of mutual enrichment. <laughs> It could probably, I'm not sure it can be in two directions. That's what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> you understand, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Father, for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm just wondering, when you, you pick up the theme of Alexander Ex it seems to me that the converse is true very much when we talk about people's spirituality of the Mass. When it comes to both their view or our view, <clears throat> or the church that's pertaining in the church often, with regards to God, and regards to the cross, because um, there was a move very much within 20th, 20th century philosophy to make uh, theology, to make God much more imminent, much more focal on his personality, to relationality. There is, in fact, a view of God, very common called theistic personalism, which very much feeds into this, um, to the expense of his transcendence. And so the liturgy has become much more uh, about that. Uh, so we've seen all these sort of 70s, 80s hymns that you and I suffered under in various settings. Um, and we, we go contrary to the sense of transcendence that I get when I go to the extraordinary form, uh, certainly to the, the, uh, the oratory. On the other hand, there's a, a lack of, in my view, specificity about our theology of the cross, because we're going to talk about the theology of the mass as a representation of what Christ is doing, um, then it is crucial to know the theology of the cross if you're going to know the theology of the mass. And yet there is this lack of specificity as to what, how exactly the cross works. How is it that a man die, even the God man die? Um, redeems the sins of mankind. And because of that, there's a lesser understanding, perhaps, of the way the Mass works and how transcendently awesome it is. I'm just wondering, in your pastoral experience and maybe theological experience as well, if you, you, you see that playing out, or if you do it all. I think, well, pastorally, people, people sense the transcendent because they see their priests believe in it. And I think it really does come down to the credendi part. It comes down to what our faith tells us is going on. Um, because if, we, if you do that, there are certain consequences that, are, that follow the way you act. Uh, sort of the arms, cheddar brandy, as they call it, don't you? Which all focused is towards a transcendent reality that's actually happening. I think that some of the issues you mentioned are issues that have affected the whole church, and, uh, which are a kind of poison, I'm afraid. Well, I'll say that, and they are. Um, to, the th to the proper theology of what rites, Catholic rites and sacraments do, that they are outward signs of an inward grace, that something is happening, something is really being transformed or changed in all of the sacraments. Um, why is it, for example, that we have a book of blessings which doesn't bless anything? I mean, even to the point that a book has been published uh, with the church's authority that doesn't really it's not very performative. Now that is a huge problem. So, I wasn't going to say that, but I think that's a massive problem. The sacraments do things. When Christ says, this is my body, it is, by virtue of what happens in the sacrament. So I think people, the short answer is that people respond to transcendent reality when they see their priests and their fellow faithful believing it. We are an example to each other in that sense. I wouldn't want to make any other theological speculation that's above my head <laughs> on that matter. You hinted at it when you referred to sort of cultural variations around the world. Do you think, in one sense, the using the vernacular has, on the one hand, damaged 
Catholicity in that, especially because the vernacular came in at a time when we were having a much more globalized world, with people traveling a lot more, that you now can't just rock in, roll into a, a Catholic church on the other side of the world and understand what's going on in that sense. So on the one hand, Catholicity, but also the way it affects the next surrounding next identity because the variations in translation. I mean, I think Pope Benedict's letter to the German bishop saying, um, you know, it's not for all, it is for many, oh, see, yeah. and things like that. The, the impact on, yeah, the letter on the expedenti, but also on the Catholicity of the church as a whole. Yes, it's things like language and gesture, which transcend text and variations in text. Those are things which remain the same. So, yeah, you're right that they, of course, have affected Catholicity. I agree with that. But, you know, it's not that the vernacular doesn't have any place in, even in the liturgical life of the church, to some extent, I mean, legitimately. But there has to be, really, um, a sense of sacred language. So you need to read Michael Langer, now this again, <laughs> his great book on, on language, the church of language, Latin the church of language, because he talks a lot about some of those issues. Um, for example, you, a lot is made. Um, particularly with the ordinary movement and things like that, about what hieratic English is meant to be. Um, I'm yet to be convinced that it just doesn't sound old fashioned. It's not quite the same thing as a sacred language. But, but I don't want to, that's too simplistic a critique. But, but um, yeah. My main point is that people understand the faith less, even though things are said in their own language. That's the point. One more, please. I just want to quote, I can't resist quoting uh, an oratory father, you've given us some wonderful quotes. But on the subject of um, delivery faith within the liturgy, he said, in the old days, we used to give people fillet steak served with silver cutlery. Now we give them porridge on plastic spoons. <laughs> yes, that's good. I'm coming to you for that. I mean, yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> yeah. In a sense, that what the church has in her tradition is a feast. It's a feast for the soul, uh, but it's a feast in every other sense, artistically, musically, linguistically, everything else that you've studied, the, the kind of liturgical accidents of it, you see. But the substance of it is a banquet, it's a feast. Pray that prayer, O sacrum convivium. You know, it's not a drive-in. It's... <laughs> And I think that's really, you know, I don't want to be too pious about it either, but it's true really that nothing changes unless we change. We, need to, we do need to pray about this. And I'm, I hesitate because I, why are my opinions any more important than anyone else's? They're not, of course. There's a lot of great scholarship around, though. There's a lot of thinking. The church seems to have turned a corner for the better when it comes to all of these things, which is a great hope. But I think uh, we've, got to, we've got to love the church in spite of whatever we might not like about it or whatever is genuinely problematic and difficult in it. Um, we've got to love her for what she is, you know. And that really, it, the Mass exists for the salvation of souls, and it's still there, and it still saves souls. And please come and say mine and yours. But after that, 